Ever since I bought my Refurber Surface Pro 8 last year, I've had a lot of trouble figuring out why I bought it. Originally, the thought was that I would sell my hardly used older iPad and my underpowered Surface Laptop Go and consolidate them into a single powerful tablet that I can use to consume media, but also get real work done on it when I need to. I'd consider getting an insane tablet like the Samsung Tab S10 Ultra, but at a starting price tag of around $1,000 for a tablet that I didn't even have the option of installing my Windows-based dev tools on, I decided to snag the Refurbished Surface Pro 8 deal from Best Buy instead. Unfortunately, at the time I was erring on the side of this being a casual device when I bought it, so I cheaped out a bit and chose the i5 8GB of RAM model, which at first was totally fine for everything from streaming YouTube in the kitchen to emulating full-on Switch games at a decent frame rate. But once I had the device, I decided it'd be awesome if it could be my everything device, from moderate gaming and media consumption all the way up to my very heavy developer workflow. And that last one is what really drove home the fact that I had bought a lower model of the Surface and that maybe I hadn't thought through what my needs were before I bought this device. Flash forward a year and my Surface has mostly ended up being used for media consumption, but even then I haven't really been drawn to it for YouTube or Instagram, and I realized that I was missing the simple point and shoot interface that I've come to expect with a media consumption tablet. And then it finally hit me. The Android x86 projects have been around for quite a while, and there has to be a project still active enough to have ported a recent version of Android to Surface hardware, which was precisely the case when I found Bliss OS. Not only does it have a fairly stable beta build of Android 13, but they have a separate version that incorporates the wonderful Surface Kernel project, which does a ton of legwork to make the Surface's proprietary and fairly unusual hardware play nice with Linux. On top of that, it looked like I could still keep Windows around in a dual boot for those times when I wanted to play some Windows games or perform moderate dev tasks. So at this point, I was sold, and that takes us right into the installation steps if you want to do this yourself. First, you'll want to grab the version you prefer. I'd recommend Bliss OS 15 if you want to play it safer, or 16 if you like newer features but don't mind tweaking a few things, which we'll get to in a bit. In my case, I grabbed the latest Surface build of Bliss OS 16 that includes Google Apps support from their download page here. However, if you're watching this in late 2024 and the latest build is still this October build, I'd actually recommend grabbing the September build as apparently its Bluetooth drivers are working properly, whereas the October build I chose doesn't have working Bluetooth right now. I'm sure that'll get fixed in an update soon though. Once downloaded, we'll flash that to a USB drive using the ever useful Belena Etcher, or you can use Rufus if you prefer. Once that's flashed, to make it easier on ourselves, if you're going to do a dual boot, I recommend shrinking your Windows partition now using the Windows Disk Manager instead of having to do it in the install process. Bliss OS maybe only needs like 30 gigs to account for its OS and a bit of head room, but I gave it 300 gigs because I have a terabyte SSD in my surface, so why not? We can then either reboot into advanced startup from the Windows settings, where it should let us choose to boot from our newly flashed USB drive, or the method I used, which was to shut down the surface and turn it back on while holding the volume up button, which should then present us with the UEFI menu. From there, we'll go to boot menu, and we can just swipe left on our USB drive to boot from it. Once greeted with the Bliss OS boot menu, you can choose to test out the OS with the live environment if you like, but for our purpose of the video, we'll just head right into the installation. If you have experience installing a popular Linux distro like Ubuntu before, this install process will definitely feel a little more old school akin to the Windows XP installation process, but it's actually not too bad. First, we'll see this screen asking us to select an EFI partition, and we'll just scroll down to create slash modify partitions. We'll choose to use the default CF disk tool, as in my experience, it works more reliably than CG disk. And from there, we'll scroll down to our free space, use the left and right arrow keys to choose new and hit enter, type 1G to create a one gigabyte partition, hit enter, and then while hovering over that new partition, use the left and right arrow keys again to choose type and set it to an EFI system. We'll do that same process with the remaining disk space, but we'll let it use the remaining free disk space and leave it at the default Linux file system. Before we quit, take note of the names of your new EFI partition and Linux partition, as we'll need that in a second. When we quit out of that, we'll be asked what the EFI partition should be, and you guessed it, we'll choose the number of the one we just created for the EFI partition. It'll ask if we can format this to FAT32, and we'll say yes. Then it'll ask us where to install Bliss OS, and we'll choose our new Linux partition, format it as ext4, say yes, and allow it to be prepped for OTA updates if you want, and choose Grub as our bootloader, which worked more reliably in my experience. Hit OK, and the installer will then copy some files, and if all went well, it should tell you that BlissOS was installed successfully, and we can either run BlissOS right away, or reboot our system. I'd recommend hitting reboot so you can eject your flash drive when the computer shuts down, and then make sure Grub and BlissOS boot from your internal drive correctly. On reboot, we should see the BlissOS Grub menu, giving us the option to boot into the default BlissOS, 
the PC version of BlissOS, and at the bottom our Windows partition, which is perfect. The PC version is apparently supposed to give us a cursor style interface over a touch style interface, but we'll hop into the default BlissOS since the whole point of this project was to turn the Surface into a proper Android tablet. We'll then be greeted with a fairly stock Android setup wizard, so you can tap through that as you please, and then finally you'll be greeted with the home screen of your new Android tablet. Now we're not quite done yet as there's some configuration housekeeping to do for this all to run well, but before we jump into that, I should tell you that the Black Friday deals on Coulter.store are on now, and the first 100 people to use code Black Friday will get 10% off all items in their order, and the amount of products on there are growing all the time, like this super soft iLinux and Let's Start button shirts. So check out Coulter.store and use code Black Friday to get 10% off your order. Back over to our new Android tablet, one of the first things that'll ask you is what launcher you want to use by default, and after testing Smart Launcher in desktop mode, I landed on Launcher 3, which is basically the stock Android tablet interface. Now if your experience is like mine, you'll notice that the touchscreen works, but no matter what you do, it only behaves like a trackpad for a mouse cursor rather than a touchscreen, which it gets old really fast, especially when the point was to turn this into a regular tablet. Also, if you're like me, your volume and lock buttons won't be functioning, but thankfully these were known bugs that will likely get fixed in an upcoming update, and there are patch fixes available we'll apply in a second. Before we hop into those, it's worth noting that the Bliss OS options in the settings is where you can change the navigation type from gestures to buttons, which is helpful if you're stuck in cursor mode like I was. To apply the patch fixes, we'll navigate over to the system info to rapid tap the build number to unlock developer mode, as I'm sure you've done many times if you're watching this video, then enable ADB over Wi-Fi, which will let us connect to our Android tablet via the computer to make some core changes. You can also use ADB over USB, but for some reason that didn't work for me. Now to proceed, you will need the Android ADB command line tools installed on your computer, and I'll link a guide for how to do that in the description below. But once you have that in place, here's the process for fixing the touchscreen behavior. Using the link in the description, we'll download this script from GitHub by clicking the download raw file button. We'll CD into the folder you downloaded that script to, grab the network IP address of our Surface by tapping the gear on your wireless network name in the settings, and then on your computer, type ADB connect your IP address colon 5555. Once connected, we'll type this command, which will create a file on our machine with a list of devices the tablet knows about. In that file, we'll search for the keyword touchscreen and find the entry that has an identifier line shortly after it like this. We'll need to know those four digits after the 0x for the vendor, product, and version code in the script shortly. Then on the command line, type ADB root, then ADB push, the name of the script, slash SD card slash download, to copy the script over to the device itself. We'll then run this command, substituting in the name of the script, the vendor code, product code, and version code, and you can see in the screen recording what the command ended up being for me here. We'll then reboot our surface, and if all went well, the touchscreen will now behave properly. With that when done, we'll move over to the volume and power buttons, and we'll turn back to our command line to do the following. While connected to the device via ADB, We'll run adb root again, then adb shell, this command to temporarily make the system folder writable, then this command to open a command line text editor to edit the main init file. This will look rather intimidating, but all we need to do is scroll down to the function called do init, or search for it with control W, and add this snippet to the end of the function after the post init line. We'll save that with control O, exit with control X, and then run this command to revert the write permissions on the system folder. We'll finally restart the tablet once more, and if all went well, the volume and power buttons should be functioning properly now. I haven't used this setup long enough to know if these fixes will remain after you update BlissOS, but hopefully these fixes get rolled into the main BlissOS for Surface offering soon, and then they'll just work out of the box. But with all that done, we now have an absolutely jacked device for an Android tablet, and I think it's only fitting that we see how it performs with some heavier Android gaming. Hopping into Mario Kart Wii and Dolphin here, we're going to use the Vulcan backend, and crank it to a 1080p upscale with anti-aliasing on as well to really try and push this a bit and as we can see there's a slight load in of the textures at the very start of the round but after that this is a super smooth 60 fps mario kart round enough for me to properly crush the cpus at 150 cc i was going to try to up the anti with switch emulation on this device but i couldn't get any of the switch emulator android apks to run on this device plus with all the crackdowns it was sort of scattered to find the right apks anyway so since the windows half of this device was able to run switch games decently well i would say the android half probably could too if the right apk could be found as for native android gaming i decided to use asphalt 8 which as you can see ran extremely well. I even tried to crank it to best visuals, which the game rebooted and things seemed to be less pixely, but then when I go back into the settings, it would be back in that sort of uh, middle ground between performance and visuals. So I don't know if that took effect, but either way, Asphalt 8 runs super well on the Surface Pro 8, so Android is definitely taking advantage of the actual hardware underneath. And the controller I'm using for these tests is the MobilePad N1 HD controller with liquid silicon buttons, Hall Effect joysticks, ALPS HD vibration, and a ton more features like gyroscope and all 
and all that. It's even got NFC to tap Amiibos on it when it's paired with your Switch, so check out the link in the description to learn more. I'm really pleased with how this project turned out, and I think I'll be using my Surface a lot more now that it's sporting a modern Android operating system I can naturally use for a wide variety of tasks, but when I need to, I can still boot back into Windows for certain games or work tasks I might want to get done while on the go. I do wish my build had Bluetooth working so I could see how my Surface Pen behaves in Bliss OS and if features like palm rejection are working so note taking doesn't suck, but maybe one of you will grab a build with working Bluetooth and let me know in the comments how that goes. And if you've got a Surface, let me know if this Bliss OS install is something you're planning on doing to change up how you use it, or if you think this was an absolutely terrible idea. And if you like this video, please consider subscribing and maybe check out my recent video where I built a budget PS5 Pro competitor PC.